So today we're going to discuss abnormal psychology. And abnormal psychology might sound like a scary subject for some, but really when we say abnormal, it doesn't mean bad, it just means not atypical, or atypical, not typical. Atypical means not typical. <laughs> um, so abnormal psychology really just means things that aren't normal. And if we think about it, right, we have all experienced things that aren't normal. Um, some of us have experienced things, psychologically speaking, that are much further away than normal than the norm um, than others. But really, the human experience, part of the human experience, is experiencing things occasionally that aren't normal. So, abnormal psychology. We're going to be talking about diagnoses. We're going to be talking about the DSM. We're going to be talking about the clinical side of things. But keep in mind that this is really all a spectrum. And so, even though um, there may be some of us with diagnoses and some of us without, we can all understand some of these things because we're all humans. And even though we may struggle with some things and another person will struggle with something different, we all can understand the different ways in which we're broken. Um, so, we're going to explore the specific diagnoses and the different categories of the DSM and talking about abnormal psychology. Uh, one of the things that's always interesting when people study abnormal psychology, it's kind of a, a famous thing, is that people start to see the diagnoses that they have while they're going through it. And they start to think, oh no, do I have OCD? Oh no, do I have these things? And again, one of those, one of the reasons for that is because we all have these pieces in them. In us. So one of the things I want you to think about as you're watching this lecture is which of these diagnoses do you relate with more? Which of them do you understand better? Which of them can you can you visualize better? Maybe it's because you have them yourself, maybe it's because you have personal experience with them, or maybe it's just because you understand them a little bit better. You have experienced those traits in your life. So again, it can conjure up some scary images thinking about normal uh, abnormal psychology for some people, but we're not going to go down that road today. Okay, so the DSM, uh, Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders, which is put, put out by the American Psychiatric Association, uh, called the APA, and if some of you say, hey, the APA is also the American Psychological Association, you are right. They both are the APA, and they're not going to change their initials, so it's confusing. It's very confusing. Um, but, so it's in the, currently in the fifth edition, uh, the sixth edition will probably be coming out in the next decade or so. Usually uh, a new edition comes out every 20-ish years, and uh, DSM-5 came out in 2013. So one of the things to consider with the DSM is the DSM gives uh, diagnoses codes, right? Labels. So one of the things to think about with labels. Okay, so are labels dehumanizing or do labels become excuses? So this is something I want everybody to think about a little bit and have your own opinion on. I am going to do a little bit of pro-con here myself, a little bit of devil's advocate. So, on the one hand, labels can be very helpful because it can give a whole bunch of information very quickly to somebody, uh, another clinician, right? You can just say a couple of different diagnoses and it gives uh, another person who knows that clinical knowledge, it can give them a great deal of information that might take uh, you know, 30 minutes or so to relate to them otherwise. And a lot of times in the field, 30 minutes, even though it doesn't sound like much, 30 minutes is more than, than you would have to relate all that information. On the other hand, sometimes when people know their diagnoses, it can get them to start making excuses. Well, I, I don't have to do X because I have ADHD, or I don't have to do this because, so it can start to be used as an excuse. Sometimes it can also be used as a way to dismiss people. Oh, well, Johnny's never going to be very good at blank because his diagnosis is X. And so it becomes kind of a lens to look at people through and be dismissive of. So the, the codes and the diagnoses that the DSM has, I, I, I want everybody to look, think of the good and the bad that can come with it. Because I really do think it's a double-edged sword. There's good and there's bad. So think for a second, which do you think wins out? Do you think even though, I mean, maybe you don't think there's any good. Maybe you don't think there's any bad. You still don't have to agree with me. So think about it for a second, and what do you think? And if you do think that there's some good and some bad, which one do you think it more is? Do you think it's more good than bad? Do you think it's more bad than good? What's your opinion? Okay. The DSM uses the, the biopsychosocial approach. So the biopsychosocial approach, not surprisingly, means looking at biological, the psychological, and the social. 
right? So this means we're actually looking at like brain chemistry and such the biological piece. We're looking at psychological, so trauma, other things that happen. And then the social, we're looking at community, connectivity, family of origin, things like that. And recognizing that these are all a huge piece to the person, to their uh, mental illness and how it is manifested, and then consequently their, their diagnosis and their treatment. Okay, so the first category we're going to look at, the, the uh, DSM, these are, and these categories that we're going to look at are the categories that the DSM itself is broken into. So the first one is anxiety. So we're going to just read a little bit from the DSM, don't want to bore you guys too much, but I want to give you a little bit straight from the horse's mouth. Anxiety disorders include disorders that share features of excessive fear and anxiety and related behavioral disturbances. Fear is the emotional response to real or perceived imminent threat, whereas anxiety is anticipation of future threat. The anxiety disorders differ from one another in the types of objects or situations that induce fear, anxiety, or avoidance behavior, and the associative cog associated cognitive ideation. Okay. So, right, so one of the things I really like about this is that the DSM clearly tells you how they are defining fear and anxiety is different, right? So fear is the emotional response to a real or perceived imminent threat. Anxiety is the anticipation of a future threat. Okay, okay. so these are the um, uh, diagnoses under anxiety. Um, some common ones, separation anxiety disorder, um, generalized anxiety disorder is a pretty common one as well. Anxiety due to another medical condition uh, that, is, that is not uncommon. And again, this is important to note uh, when a diagnosis is taking place that maybe, maybe it seems like it's generalized anxiety disorder, but you look further and you look deeper and you find that, oh, it's really actually related to a medical condition of a, a, just a diagnosis of cancer they just got or a medical condition of, um, I don't know, rabies or something else that they got which is causing uh, this anxiety and related to this anxiety such that if that medical condition went away, went in remission, was treated successfully, whatever, we would very likely see this anxiety go away as well. Agoraphobia, so this comes from the, um, the Greek for agora, right, the marketplace, so this means fear of crowds. Um, and I think that we're, uh, fear of, yeah, sometimes it can be used as fear of other people, but it, it means it really has a crowded connotation. Um, and I think we're, we're seeing this increase. We did, we did see this increase pretty drastically with all the COVID-19 stuff. Um, and a, a lot of people are having their patterns hard to change, so we might see that, that continue for a while, uh, increase for a while. This is a video right here. Um, if you guys can, can uh, put the, uh, watch this link, I'll, put, I'll try to uh, put this link or um, similar link in. Um, uh, blackboard for you all. So you can see a picture of a panic attack. Oh, this actually, um, it's not its not a picture of a panic attack it's in the sense that it's not a video of somebody having a panic attack. What it is, is it's kind of a, um, a description of, from somebody who has had panic attacks and they kind of, they use visual cues and such to ha kind of give you a sense of what that panic attack feels like. It's pretty hard to relate to somebody who hasn't had a panic attack, what it feels like. Um, and so I think that this is a, a good video to watch just to kind of have that extra awareness of what people are going through when they have a panic attack. Okay, so then you have OCD and related. OCD of course stands for uh, um, obsessive compulsive disorder. Um, so you also have body dysmorphic disorder. So body dysmorphic disorder is when people see their body in a certain way that is not the case. So this might, um, and this can, this can go with other disorders too, that this can go with anorexia and bulimia um, and, and other things that we'll discuss a little bit later. Um, I say, yeah, so sorry, here we go through. Body dysmorphic like disorder with actual flaws, body dysmorphic like disorder with out repetitive behavior. So these are some of the specifiers for other specified obsessive, uh, obsessive compulsive and related disorder. So 
what this really shows is that obsess um, sorry, body dysmorphic disorder can work its way through several different diagnoses. It's got a lot of connections. So it's got a connection, obviously, to its own disorder. It's got a connection to um, some other uh, related disorder specifiers. It's got a relation to anorexia and bulimia. It's got a relation to several others. But really, when we talk about body dysmorphic disorder, what that means is that people are not seeing their body as it is. And it, this isn't just a simple case of, oh, I, feel, I think I look fat, and I don't really. No, this really is, they do not see reality. When they stand in front of a mirror, they see something that is not there. Right? Um, so really, it does get, get on the, um, you know, their, their um, it, it, gets, it gets close to like the delusional standpoint, right? They're, um, they're, they're experiencing a reality that is not real and, and brings complications for them. Uh, trichotillomania, so hair pulling, um, exploration, so like um, scraping yourself, um, things like that. So these ones again, all based in uh, obsessive compulsive uh, behaviors. Um, and here's a, a little video to watch about that to give you a little bit more of an insight into what that looks like as well. Okay, next is depressive disorders. Okay, so the DSM says presence of sad, empty, or irritable mood accompanied by somatic and cognitive changes that significantly affect the individual's capacity to function. Mm -hmm. What differs among them are issues of duration, timing, or presumed etiology. And when we say etiology, what that means is origin, like where something came from. Um, so again, sad, empty, or irritable. So some people are, you know, kind of shocked by the irritable thing, but it's important to keep in mind that not everybody manifests depression in the same way. Um, it's not uncommon, especially for men, to manifest depression as irritable. So if you know somebody, it certainly could be a female as well, but it's just a little bit more common than men. If you know a man who suddenly becomes very irritable, it could be depression and not anger or something like that, which we typically go to anger right away with men. It might very well not be anger. It might be depression. Um, so here are some of the depressive uh, disorders that we have. Um, so major depressive disorders, MDD, that's one we see pretty often. Um, dysthymia used to be called that, now it's called persistent depressive disorder. Um, so these are some just some common ones we see. Again, these are the, the list of them. Trauma and stressor-related disorders. Okay. So disorders in which exposure to a traumatic or stressful event is listed explicitly as a diagnostic criterion. Close relationship between these diagnoses and disorders in the surrounding chapter on anxiety disorders, obsessive compulsive and related disorders, and disassoci disassociative disorders. Okay, so what they're saying right here is that they recognize a close relationship between trauma and stressors and anxiety, obsessive compulsive, uh, and dissociative. Because trauma is related to those things. The trauma can often then manifest symptoms uh, that would then get you a diagnosis in that, those categories. So one of the things they're first saying too is that trauma can happen and then a whole bunch of different symptoms can happen from trauma. In order to be placed under the trauma and stressor related disorders, the traumatic event has to actually be listed as a diagnostic criterion. So it itself has to be part of it. Because if you think about it, like let's, let's take PTSD for one. We've all heard of PTSD. PTSD can manifest symptoms that could be other disorders, right? And if there's no traumatic event that gives that as an onset, those symptoms an onset, then, then labeling it PTSD is not correct because it was not a traumatic event as the diagnostic criterion, and really all of those symptoms have another etiology, have another cause, and that needs to be pursued. So whenever a diagnosis comes from this, what it's really, really highlighting is, yeah it's, yeah, it's telling you some symptoms and it's telling you what the behaviors and everything are looking like, but what it's really, really highlighting is, look at the trauma, look at the trauma. The trauma needs to be looked at, the trauma needs to be worked on, the trauma needs to be addressed. Um, as opposed to uh, if you're seeing some of these same symptoms and it's another diagnosis that's removed from trauma and you would handle it a little bit differently. So these are some uh, videos about RAD, which is reactive attachment disorder, um, and, and, and then an episode of um, a meltdown in RAD. And I will tell you, it's not for the faint of heart. Um, it is, it's a lot more than just um, 
what used to be called right, having a fit, a kid pitching a fit. It's a lot more than that. Okay, so then we have bipolar and related disorders. Uh, it's a bridge between the two diagnostic classes of schizophrenia spectrum and depressive disorders. So again, they're recognizing this category has a lot in common with other categories. In terms of symptomatology, family history, and genetics. So they're, again, they're, they're pointing out this overlap that is seen. Um, bipolar 1 and bipolar 2 disorder are very similar, except for uh, bipolar 2 does not have to have the presence of a manic episode. Um, Psychothymic disorder, um, unspecified bipolar related disorder. So these are some other dis disorders that are in here. And as you can see, bipolar and related is its own category. And one of the reasons is that though bipolar has real it has in things in common with other categories, right, as the DSM recognizes here, it's also uniquely different than other categories. So it's not, a, it's not a natural fit in any other category, thus it really has its own. Okay, schizophrenia and related. Okay, so defined by abnormalities in one or more of the following five domains. Delusions. So delusions are the mind, like how you're thinking, your thinking is wrong. Hallucinations is what you see. So you're seeing something that's not there. Disorganized thinking, uh, specifically going back to speech. Grossly disorganized or abnormal motor behavior, including catatonia. Catatonia, and catatonia is not moving. That's in catatonic means you're not moving. It's like you're in a coma state. Uh, and negative symptoms. So negative symptoms are not having something. Um, okay, so schizophrenia, schizotypal, um, schizophreniform. These, catatonia, right, associated with another mental disorder. So these are all diagnoses that involve a, a, a very strong abnormality of how the brain is functioning, again, including delusions and hallucinations, which are typically the um, two big hallmarks of this, uh, of this section. Um, disorganized thinking manifested in speech. If for me, when I used to work on a lockdown um, clinical ward, one of the things, psychiatric ward, one of the things that was a big trigger to me that someone had psychiatric or, sorry, a schizophrenic disorder was the disorganized speech. That was a, usually a really, really early sign when you talk to somebody. Um, all of a sudden, their speech wouldn't make sense. It would be very disorganized. Their words would make sense. They're, like, you would understand the individual words. They'd be speaking English or whatever the language was. Um, but there would be no sense that could be made of the words that were being put together. Um, and then there's, there are some videos about it too. Um, one of the things that I think is interesting about schizophrenia is that some uh, research has shown recently that it might be very strongly connected to the cingula insula, which is a part of the brain, area of the brain. And for most people who do not have schizophrenia, the, schizula, um, the cingula insula is nice and ridged and ribbed. Um, but for people that do have schizophrenia, it tends to be more smooth. And I, I'm holding my pinky because it's not that big. Um, and so they're actually able to do scans and with some accuracy be able to be able to actually um, uh, physically determine if people have schizophrenia or not based on the smoothness or bumpiness of the, the cingula insula. Uh, in a way that I have heard schizophrenia talked about that I think is very helpful, uh, gives people good insight into what schizophrenia is like is, so I'd like you to right now think of something outlandish. Think of an outlandish animal that you never see in Alaska or Texas or Hawaii or wherever you are. Think of an outlandish animal. Now think of it being a crazy color. Okay. Now think of that outlandish animal that's a crazy color. Think of it saying something to you. Okay. So. We all just thought of a crazy animal with a cr that was crazy color telling us to do something. But do you think that there was actually that animal that was that color that told you that to do? Do you actually think that really happened like in your room, wherever you are? Do you think that that just happened? Your ability to know that, no, I just thought that. That was just in my brain, of course. That ability to know that what is in your brain did not happen. It was a thought. And the difference between what is happening in real life, what is actually happening, and what is happening in your brain is a big difference between you know, people that have a, a typical brain and people that have a schizophrenic brain. It, they could not tell the difference. 
schizophrenic people might not be able to. If they had thought of a, um, of a um, purple and white striped elephant that said, you know, hey, let's go have some nachos, they might actually think that a purple and white striped elephant saying, hey, let's go have some nachos, had been in their room. And they not, might not be able to differentiate what was happening in my brain and what happened in the real world. Okay, so the personality disorders, this is a huge category. We're going to go through it pretty quickly, though. Personality disorders are broken up into three clusters. They are typically not diagnosed in people that are under the age of 18. And one of the reasons for this is that personality disorders are seen as not changing. But by and large in the community, personality disorders are seen as being persistent lifelong because they are the personality of the individual. They're not... Uh, mental disorders that can be reordered, they are actually the core of the person. So whether or not you believe that or not, that is just generally the way it's looked at in the community. And so it's very, very, very rare that you, or that you should ever see anybody get a personality disorder diagnosis under the age of 18. So you got cluster A, which is eccentric or odd behavior patterns. So you got paranoid, schizoid, schizotypal. Cluster B, excessively dramatic, emotional, or erratic behavior. So antisocial personality disorder, which um, a lot of people who end up in prison for violent crimes, especially like murderers, uh, are diagnosed with anti -pers antisocial personality disorder. Um, borderline personality disorder, histrionic, narcissistic, I mean, we're, we're kind of familiar with some of those, right? Cluster C, highly anxious or fearful behavior patterns. So you've got avoidant or then a dependent, kind of the opposite, right, part of that. And then obsessive compulsive personality disorder. Uh, and then again, there's, there's a video about that as well. So basically, right, you have personality disorders broken down into these three clusters. One is eccentric and just kind of like odd behavior. And the other one is very like, maybe you could almost think of this as like the like theater kind of pumped up, right? So this isn't like normal theater, uh, you know, drama, oh, you know, drama queen kind of behavior. This is kind of like that, some of that like amped up. Um, with antisocial in there as well. And, and antisocial usually means, um, and you kind of think of antisocial and narcissism as having a lot in common. Um, narcissistic, they're, they're both very, very focused on themselves and don't really see other people as existing or mattering as much as they do. Uh, one of the reasons typically the antisocial personality disorder people can hurt other people is because they, they don't have empathy. They don't see other people as mattering, so they can hurt them and it doesn't matter. It's not them, what does it matter? Um, narcissistic, narcissistic people tend to use other people to get what they want, not necessarily through violence, um, but as tools to get what they want. And then cluster C, right, this is a very anxious uh, personality that would, um, that would be in this, this sort of category. Okay, so treatment. So we are going to talk about five different kinds of treatment very quickly. We're not going to go into this in depth, just kind of give you a little glimpse of the psychotherapy. Um, the psychotherapy treatment, There's certainly there are a lot of meds, but we're not going to cover meds. Uh, and there are uh, certain disorders, really the main disorder that, that works better with meds than anything else is schizophrenia. And schizophrenia works, uh, treatment for schizophrenia is best when it's meds and psychotherapy combined. Okay, so you have humanistic. This is a picture for humanistic. And humanism is really just, humanism is just the belief that we can all innately heal ourselves and what is needed is to kind of get out of our way and help other people get out of our way. You've got existential, which is what is it all about? What's the meaning of it? If I understood the meaning or if I could have this mean something uh, correctly, it would be okay. So um, imagine that you get rear-ended in traffic. You might, you know, your first instinct is to be all mad. You see a guy behind you flipping you off and you go, oh, because the meaning that you have ascribed to what's going on is that here's this jerk, man, he's just cutting me off, he's just being mean. Oh, and you, you get riled up and you get mad. Now, imagine that you get rear-ended in traffic and you look behind you and the person behind you is uh, a, an elderly woman who's shaking and having a seizure. Well, you're probably not going to get mad anymore. You're probably not going to be like, oh, I got to go and help her and get out of your car and go help right? Because it's what it means, right? You, in both situations, you are rear-ended. The, 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 the physical reality to your car is the exact same in both situations. 
But in one of those situations, the meaning that you ascribe to it is, oh, here's this person trying to have power over me and hurt me. Oh, I'm going to fight against that. And in the other situation, the meaning that you ascribe to it is, oh, it was this person who didn't mean to do it. She needs help. I need to go and help her. Right? And so the meaning that was given to the situation, even though it was the exact same physical reality of your, to your car, but the meaning that you gave to it drastically alters how you experience it. Okay, behavioral, stop thinking and just do it. So this is all about, yeah, 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 talking about your feelings and your past, that stuff's all, you know, well and fine, but really, got to change what you're doing right now. If you don't change what you're doing right now, what does that other stuff really matter? you got to focus on what you're doing, what you're actually doing, and change that. That's behaviorism. Cognitive, cognitive is all about thoughts. Cognitive is all about um, stinking thinking, right, changing behavior patterns so that what you're thinking and how you're thinking is correct, that you're not, um, the expression is you're not shouldn't on yourself, you know, I should do this and I should do this, and that really burdens you with that. So what, you're, what you need to do is change the way of thinking so that you're, you know, getting out of your own way and what you're doing is um, thinking appropriately about things in ways that you can have control over them and not feel powerless and change what you can change. And psychoanalytic, which we commonly associate with Freud, oftentimes called psychodynamic nowadays. This is where we get kind of the classic, you know, the patient laying on a couch. Not to say they do it all that way um, anymore, um, but that's just kind of classic how it is. Psychoanalytic um, theory is really based in your childhood and your past is very important. Understanding those unconscious motives for things and getting to the root of that. Uh, and then usually psychoanalysis usually involves a, a lot more work over a lot longer time. It doesn't always, it's not always the case nowadays, psychodynamic doesn't always do that, but just generally speaking. Okay, so these are some um, videos of people who actually invented these treatment styles. Um, so you got uh, Rogerian or person-centered treatment uh, therapy, you've got Fritz Perls from Gestalt, you've got um, Ellis for rational motive therapy. So these are three different treatment styles. This was these were videos done in the 60s with an actual client named um, what's his name? I can't remember right now. Gloria, Gloria, um, and it's the same same woman with each of them. And again, the the man she's talking to are actually the men that developed these theories. So you're getting to see them do their own theories. It's very interesting to compare them. Uh, and here are the links. Be able to watch those if you're interested. Okay, and just the, the last thing for us to think about is how do we define psychopathology? How do we how do we define that? Where do we get this definition of psychopathology? It's important to note that things in the DSM have changed. Diagnoses that were once considered mental disorders are no longer considered mental disorders, right? They're now parades to celebrate them. Um, and consequently, things are being added to the DSM. Things that didn't exist a few years ago are, are being added to the DSM. Um, they're looking at a tech disorder diagnosis that may be in DSM-6. So these things are changing. The, one generation thinks something is a mental disorder, the next generation doesn't, vice versa. It goes back and forth. So this is not a static, this is the definition of mental health, and this is not, I mean, according to the DSM, or at least, that is not a static definition of mental health. Um, so some things I want you to consider as you think about how we define psychopathology is what would you say? Whatever's maladaptive in society? Well, that might work to some degree. It might not work to some degree, right? What about, what about people who resisted Hitler in World War II? That was maladaptive to society. However, it was maybe very adaptive to the largest society. It was definitely maladaptive to their individual goal, right? Because a lot of them died. Um, Whatever is not approved of in society, so we got a lot. We got a lot of things that are not approved of in society right now. I mean, the rules for what's approved of in society um, change daily right now. Right, um, one day somebody will be loved by the media, the next day they'll say something and it'll be considered offensive, and and they'll be hated by everybody. So, does that mean the definition of psychopathology is, is changing on a day to day, minute by minute basis nowadays? Maybe. So these are just some things to get you thinking, but what do you think? What, what are the different components of how psychopathology is defined? Maybe for society, and then how would you personally define psychopathology? There might be a difference between how society would define psychopathology and how you would, right?
Well, I hope you've learned a little bit about abnormal psychology today, and I hope you've also thought about how it connects to you, and that these things are not as distant as we often think. They're not in some dark corner. They're not problems that other people have. They're problems that, to some degree, we can all relate to.